I was a contractor for a tech company. A couple of weeks on the job, one of my senior colleagues suddenly resigned. The position was declared vacant and was advertised. I applied and attended an interview. Since I was the only insider who applied, I was widely touted as the best possible replacement. Two days after I was interviewed, a young college graduate walked into the office and was introduced to us as the one who had been chosen to fill the vacant position. I remember a colleague who is, who was, who is white sitting next to me that day asking what I felt about the decision. Let's call his name Ryan. I responded that since hundreds of applications were considered, I had no choice but to accept my fate as the best possible outcome. My response warmed me into the heart of Ryan. From that day on, Ryan became very much interested in knowing me and learning about my story. For most of our conversations, Ryan would listen to the echoes of my heart. He would ask questions about my heritage. Sometimes our conversation would touch the edge of topics like politics, religion, and race. One day, Ryan told me he felt that my sense of race relations was naive as compared to most Black Canadians he had met all his life. Hearing that, I felt compelled to open up to him. I told him about how I was born and raised in Nigeria, a predominantly Black nation. I lived through four military dictatorships. I left corporate Nigeria for South Africa for my postgrad. It was in South Africa that I had my first baptism of identity crisis. I lived in that country for eight years before moving to Canada. While I was telling Ryan my story, a very senior management staff of the company who was eavesdropping on our conversation suddenly jumped from his chair and paced towards me. Let's call his name John. John screamed at the top of his lungs and said, oh, I always thought, South Af I always thought you were South African. I've even told my South African friends about you. Years, late, years after I left the company to another job, I continued to maintain communications with Ryan. He became, we became great friends. We would exchange emails, instant messages, and phone calls. In one conversation, Ryan told me that John left the company shortly after me. He told me that when the issue of whether or not I was a good fit for the vacant position I was put before management at the time, it was John who stood vehemently against it. John would later confide in Ryan that he had thought I was a black South African. He told Ryan that due to the account of his white South African friends who had fled South Africa to Canada after the collapse of apartheid, he learned that black South Africans are lazy people. The fact that I'm not even South African is the worst by implicit bias I have ever confronted with. This brings me to the contention of my speech. Implicit bias, which is grounded in a basic human tendency to divide the social world into groups, appears to be the root cause of racism. We all hold biases. It is not harmful in itself until we allow it to influence the way we treat other people. That's when implicit biases transitions to explicit biases. We may succeed in putting an end to police brutality, we may succeed in bringing down all offensive monuments. We may succeed in having people of color as CEOs of large corporations. It is only when we collectively learn to call ourselves and others out on our perceived biases. It is only when we make a conscious effort to desegregate our shared spaces and have direct relationship with those who don't look or speak like us. It is only when we learn to use our privileges to lift up the marginalized around us that we may speed up that day when the dreams of Martin Luther King would be realized. A dream where everyone will be judged by the content of their character. Thank you.